Welcome everyone, Denzel Rodriguez here, your personal finance geek of the 21st century. And today I have a very special guest named Christian Duncan, who's gonna be really talking to us about primarily the velocity banking concept. But before we get into the, the juicy uh, topic of the good, the bad, the pros and cons, what we like, what we don't like of velocity banking, I first wanna introduce you to Christian, who he is, his YouTube channel, where you can find him, little background and I'm excited about this because it's it's awesome to have discussions with people that you don't necessarily agree with on a hundred percent of everything it's nice to get out of our own echo chambers for once and hear what the other side has to say because there might be a, a gem there that we can take into our own personal finances so on my channel we predominantly <clears throat> talk about velocity banking and how to get out of debt fast and we also touch on uh, life insurance and infinite banking concept and how these two kind of work together so sometimes it may sound like an echo chamber right it always sounds you know wonderful I'm always showing usually positive case studies uh, very rarely do I show negative ones or case studies where it don't where it doesn't work but I I do but not as much because I'm typically always in this like I said an echo chamber where I'm always doing case studies that usually work and and they're having success but there's a world where it doesn't work and so bringing on someone like Christian to where we can discuss these ideas and really fine-tune what we're doing in our personal finances along with getting some uh, new education I think would be great so I'm going to pass the mic to you Christian if you want to start us off with just a little bit about yourself um, your YouTube channel what you do for work and really some of your primary goals, uh, and then we can get into the, the meat and potatoes. Yes, well, Denzel, thanks so much for having me on. And I gotta say, I, I really, really appreciate you having somebody coming on that's gonna, that might have a different opinion. Um, a lot of times we get kind of stuck in this little bit of this little world that we see, and we, we forget that there's this giant universe out there, and it's good to get all those different perspectives. And we're probably gonna disagree on a lot of things, and that's okay, right? Everybody is there to look at that and, and kind of make the decision for whatever they best they feel is best for their family, because it's gonna be different for you, it's gonna be different for me, right? We've each had different experience, um, and that life experience is what gives us, you know, it, it gives us the material to to teach on so I, I definitely appreciate that about you um, yes yeah, so my my channel is called mortgage IQ um, it was started a while ago uh, just to just to help with people and, and teaching them certain knowledge about mortgage loans and how they work and and, and things of that uh, I did a video about this particular method saying the HELOC using the HELOC method uh, which is velocity banking in order to pay off the mortgage faster and I looked at a couple different options you know comparing that to there um, and you know we can put the video up later on but um, but that's how you and I connected on there and so I think this uh, this this call is going to be fun because there's going to be some things that we probably agree on and then some other things that we're going to disagree on and that's again I think that's just going to be from different life life experience and different approaches to making something uh, work absolutely and tell us a little bit more of your of your background being in the in the mortgage industry like kind of like how where did your financial philosophies or principles kind of come from was it was it mom and dad or was it being in the industry ah. and picking up some things along the way love it love it um so yeah i was just thinking about this actually uh this morning um so early on i started i started in the industry about uh, in 2001 november of 2001 and i did i did really well and learned to make money uh, really fast. And then so, you know, I thought I was going to be a millionaire at 27. Um, but what ended up happening was at 27 or 20, you know, right around there, 26, 27, this crash came, right? So I was building up all of this capital. I thought I was doing well. I thought money grew, grew on trees. And then all of a sudden, 2007, 2008 comes and I start at zero. And I actually had to borrow money from my parents for a month. Um, and it was a, it was a tough time. But what I learned is that making money and keeping it are two completely different things. And so that experience um, changed my life and changed my viewpoint on money. And, and, and so it, it made it so that, um, you know, things are, things are much different. Like, for example, right now, my investment income covers my living expenses, right? Um, whereas before, I was going too aggressive. I was going too, too heavy on certain investments. I was making really terrible decisions. And that's just because of what was in my circle, what I was learning was all about making money and not about keeping it. And so that's kind of where I started to learn about, hey, wait a minute, 
um, there's got to be a different way because I was making a ton of money and then all of a sudden I lost it all. I lost it all, everything that I had, right? So I, I, I read two books. One is Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and the other was The Millionaire Next Door. Those two books dramatically changed my life. They gave me a different perspective on money and how to actually handle it. And learning that those two things, making money and keeping it, are two vastly different yeah. things. And then being in the mortgage industry, I've seen it, right? I've done thousands of loans. I've seen people who have very low income and have a ton of money put away, right? And, I, and I, that's relative. So it's many months of their salary put away. And I've seen people that have a ton of money, right? Multiples of what the average American makes, yet they can't afford a $500 appraisal. And so look, seeing all those has just given me a good education as far as what to do and how to handle uh, money so that, you know, I'm not in that paycheck to paycheck, uh, you know, having that, that problem. Yeah. So, so with reading rich dad, poor dad, millionaire next door, would you say those are two pretty different ways of going about your personal finance or did you see I, I think, those things come together? Like, uh, like, I, you know, I think they, I think they are different, um, in that rich dad, poor dad was changing your view on the concept of, of, you know, making money. Yeah. And so, whereas, whereas the millionaire next door, it compared two different families that had the similar income and one went on to go be really wealthy and the other just kind of stayed poor. Um, and so, you know, there, there, there could be some similar lessons between them. Um, but I think there, I think there's a lot of differences there, but you know, there's a lot of books out there and it, I yeah. get a piece, I get something different from every one of them. So, you know, read as many as you can. I like it. And just so we're, the audience understands this is sure. 2001 and you're reading these yes. books at this young age, yes. 20, 26, 27 years old. Um, at this point, did you already know about the HELOC method or velocity banking at this point, or does this come way after? Good, good question. So I'm a little bit younger than that, than, than that, but that was around 2008 or so. Right. Okay. Is when I'm you 40, I'm four, yeah, I'm 41 right now. So ah, okay, okay, not okay, 48. Okay. Don't, don't give me any extra years. All right. <laughs> um, but no, so so this method, when I had a uh, another, um, I was part of a mortgage company back in 2006, 2007. And there was a company called, came around, and I think they were World, I want to say it was World Financial, or I could be wrong on that, you know. But anyways, this was where this this idea became big. It was called the first, it was a first position HELOC. Now, I know some in the velocity banking talk about doing chunks, and others talk about doing, you know, paying the full thing off. Uh, this company was coming around and trying to get all of us that were in the mortgage industry to sell this as a product. And then that particular product had four different payments. They called it an option arm, right? So, you know, one being interest only, others were being negative amortization. We can get into that if you have questions about there. But the whole idea was to put your entire paycheck into there um, and then just, you know, live or, or pay your bills out of that home equity line of credit instead. Right. And so the people who came and tried to sell us on this, like, it seemed like an amazing idea. Um, you know, we opted to not do very many, but I know very many did. And and you know, here's what happened. Um, there are a lot of there are a lot of people out there that were were struggling, right? And I mean, the average American has what twenty three hundred in their twenty eight hundred in their bank account right now. Yeah, and we're and talking less than we're talking two thousand seven, two thousand eight, two thousand seven, everybody, two thousand seven, two thousand eight, right? Yeah. It was worse. It was worse then. So. Mm -hmm. You know, they came along and said, hey, let's do a first position HELOC. You have access now to 50 or $100,000, right? Mm -hmm. And if you put all of your cash flow into there and you, you pay your bills out of there and, and do that, you're going to pay off your house quicker. You're going to be in a better position. Guess what happens to people that have $1,000 and they suddenly get $100,000 available to them? Yeah. They don't become more disciplined. They become less disciplined. And so then it becomes, it becomes more of a problem. Now, a lot of those people ended up going into foreclosure later on, especially because as the rates went up, everything readjusted, it became a big problem. So, okay. and that was primarily, um, the, the first lien HELOC. Now at this time, they didn't, they didn't really yeah. put a name on it. It was just a company, which I think might have been called either, which is it's called today United financial freedom. But I think back then they might've been called world financial something or worth unlimited. It might've been them. I'm not too, this sure. was an actual, this was an actual bank. Oh, it was a bank. World, World Savings. World Savings Bank. That's what it is. That's what it was called? World Savings Bank. World Savings Bank. They were okay. pushing these hard back in 2006, 2007. They did a lot of them. Uh-huh. Very interesting. Okay. This is a good little history lesson because when we look at the origin of this particular strategy um, from the research I've done, and I've been able to kind of go back to the source, this initially sure. derives in Australia. I don't know if you're familiar with that. No, no. 
Okay, so there's a guy named Harj Gill wrote a book, um, how to pay off your home in five to seven years or less and, and retire sooner, something like that. It's a long title. And it started in Australia. They have something called offset accounts. And I think that is where we get our today product known as the HELOC. Um, so from what I understand, it could be totally wrong about this, but that was like the amount of like as far back as it goes. And I think this is maybe 80s as far back in, in Australia that are, are doing this type of a strategy where they're parking their okay. income into this, you know, offset account or what we know as a HELOC today, very, very similar. And then we experience what we see 06, 07, 08, where it would seem like this bank is coming at the perfect time, presenting this opportunity where people can uh, accelerate their mortgages and kind of consolidate everything into one location and, and use their home as a checking account essentially. And what you have seen is a, a majority of people failing that particular method, meaning they had 50,000 in equity or hundred thousand, and they only had a couple hundred dollars in cash flow per month. And then they, they get access to all this equity. Maybe they, maybe they consolidated debt, maybe they didn't. And they essentially ended up using all that money. Now the, now the property is maybe underwater right or over leveraged at, at this point and because the rate is variable and go up and down their payments are not fixed so it just you you've seen the part you've seen a lot of people get hurt essentially you, you've seen I, I i did from that and other yes for sure not not just that time um but yes gotcha. so that that was your first sort of introduction to the to the concept right of using using this first position um, home equity line of credit now Correct. Ask. It didn't have a name. It didn't have a name then. I think that's right. more recent. Um, okay. But yes, but I have, I have experience with home equity lines of credit over the last, you know, 20 mm -hmm. something years as well. So, yeah. So fast forward to today. Um, yep. Tell us when, when you started the YouTube channel and when did you first hear the words velocity banking and then kind of made the connection and then started kind of educating your audience on, you know, how to, you know, beware of this particular strategy and the negative. Effect. Uh, sure. So when I did the video that you found, I actually wasn't aware of the term velocity banking. Oh, okay. So that, that was a newer one. There was actually another YouTuber, uh, fantastic who commented on there. And we had a little bit of back and forth and I could tell she's a little newer as far as financial knowledge goes. She's grown her YouTube channel. Good for her. But as far as financial go knowledge goes, a little bit newer, a little bit newer to it. Right. So we had some fun uh, conversations back and forth. But the way that video, the way that video came about is in about 2010, 2011, I had a gentleman that worked for Renatus. I think you've heard of them. Yes. This is where I discovered okay. Velocity Banking because okay. they they kind of trademarked that that company has that word okay or, you know velocity banking concept to them i think is there i think they trademarked it and again they got it from uh the owner forgot his name but he went to australia discovered it and then kind of brought it sure you know to to made it made it very very popular within that organization okay cool right so so this guy very nice guy said hey christian i want to meet with you um, I have this product that I think is going to change the lives of all your clients. You know, our mortgage company back then, right? We had hundreds and hundreds of clients. So I'm always looking for things that will help people. So I said, okay, let's, let's meet and we'll talk about it. We'll see what's going on. So we go, we go to lunch um, and he brings a spreadsheet and, you know, he asked me some numbers like, how do you own your mortgage? You know, what's the cash flow? Look at things like that. Right. And so he says, well, based on what you own your mortgage and what your cash flow is, you could pay all your, your house off in one, one year and two months. And so he stands up and he's like, this is the most exciting thing. Can you believe this? And I go, well, well, wait a minute. Yes, that's true. If I put all of my cash flow, monthly cash flow into my mortgage, yeah, I could pay it off in, in a little over a year. Um, but that doesn't quite make sense for me to do that, right? I mean, I use that money and I put it in investments instead. We can talk about that at another time. But it, it doesn't quite make sense to me. And the interest rate on that HELOC is higher than what my mortgage is. So here's the thing is that that company, in my opinion, had a, a lack of understanding of how interest works. They came up with this term amortized interest. Now, everybody's welcome to look this up. Amortized interest is not a type of interest. There's only two types of interest. There is simple and compounded, right? Compounded just means interest on interest, right? Yeah. Now, a simple interest mortgage would be a forward mortgage. That's your conventional on your 30 year fix, your 15 year fix. The HELOC is also a type of simple or of a simple interest mortgage. A compound uh, type of mortgage would be a reverse mortgage. 
right? So that's where for people who are 65 and older, um, where they're not making monthly payments. And so the interest is stacking on top of each other, right? That's compound interest. As investors, we love compound interest, right? If you're paying, on, paying it, you don't. Um, and so I, I looked at that and I ran the numbers then and I, I sent it back over to him and said, hey, dude, this doesn't make sense. If I go this route, as opposed to just paying more towards the mortgage, um, it's going to take me an extra month as opposed to, you know, by, by using that HELOC method. And I've got a whole, I've got a lot of extra risk doing it that way. So that was where that concept came around and where I learned about it. The velocity banking um, name itself, I, I've only heard, you know, it's been maybe six months or so that I've heard about that. Got it. Interesting, because I wonder if Renata's had a different name for it back. You said 2010 is when they came, came approached you, 2011? Um, it could have, it was somewhere around there, 2012, and they charged, they wanted to charge all of our clients 2,100 bucks to get this education. Right, right, right. That's but, like their, that's their lowest tier model. Today, I want to say it's got to be in the neighborhood of 25K plus. That's their top, top tier program. And they're going to show you how to okay. accelerate your debt. Then they're going to graduate you into how you can now leverage debt to invest in real estate or, you know, without using any of your own money. So they use OPM, that, that sort of thing. Uh, and right. then probably their lowest tier right now is probably 30, 30, 3,500 dollars. In 2017, okay. I paid, I paid $3,000 to join that company and, you know, um, I don't know, I'm a, I must be 22 at this point, 21. I'm all excited. I'm like, what the heck is this concept? I'm like, okay, I want to get started. I want to learn this thing and, and do it. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that seems about right. But I'm, I'm wondering if they had a different name for it because when I rolled in, everybody was saying Velocity Banking like it was no tomorrow. Um, so that's pretty yeah, interesting. Yeah, didn't, they didn't use that. They didn't use that term when talking to me. So I'm assuming it's more, it's a newer yeah. name for it. Okay. Cool. So this gives us a really good framework now. And one thing that yes. I want to really point out here, what I've witnessed now being 28, I'm, I'm not from the corporate world. I've only worked in uh, restaurants, food and beverage from a young age. And then right around 22, 23, I hop into the, into the YouTube world. So I've never been in corporate space. I've never uh, uh, went that route. And what I've typically seen is anyone that promotes velocity banking, anyone that talks about it, uh, they, they usually have this rebel type of complex that I've noticed. They kind of want to go against the system. They, they think the system's against them, right? Um, okay. They're, they're against traditional ways of, of financing, of, of doing things. And, and there's usually a lot of success with, with these people, no doubt. I mean, we look at some of the most successful people in the world. Um, they've got this sort of, you know, entrepreneur spirit, go against the grain, don't do the traditional, that sort of thing. But I don't know how that translates too well when it comes to your personal finances. It does seem like there's some rock hard traditional things that just are tried and true, um, that when you implement this concept, it creates some instability. And that's something I've been able to witness and see over the last five years working with all around the world, right? All around the United States specifically, some in Canada, some in Australia. Um, so now looking at t today's environment with your YouTube channel, you've, you've put out some, some content and I'm going to actually pull it up real quick. And I, I know in my editing, I'll have my, my, uh, video editor do this. But you've had, I want to say like a, a part one and a part two, right? Really going yes. over. So that would be something I would recommend my audience to go and, and look at and see where Christian makes his points. Because even I commented, I was like, very good point here, very good point here, like good stuff. So one thing you mentioned that I myself was convinced of was that thing called amortized interest, where you just said, there's no such thing as amortized interest. Now, what would bother me is when I when I go and Google it, I, I see the definition, it's there. <laughs> when I communicate with clients, they have something called an amortization schedule and it'll and it'll sh it'll use the words, the, the banks use the words, but then I hear people like yourself say, well, it's it there's no such thing. So that would confuse me, but now I want to say I've gotten to a point where I I think I understand, but definitely would like some more clarity where I, I'm, I'm now at a point where I'm in agreement with you where it's like, okay, if we got rid of the terms, it's really only simple interest daily. And then there's daily compounding interest. And those are your two only options when it comes to any type of financing out there, regardless of right. 
what it is. Okay, so yeah, I want to take this to the whiteboard and and really draw this out for people. So point and really quick, if I may, so a ahead. amortize just to clarify is a type of payment. It's a type interest, of right? You have it's simple and and you have simple and compound. Amortizing is like, hey, if I'm lending you a hundred bucks and I'm charging you ten percent over, let's say twelve months. What's the payment that I need to charge you in order to pay that off? So each month as you make a payment and that interest drops, right? What is the payment that I need to, to make to, to pay that off? And if we stretch that out, right, we create an amortization schedule. It's a way of calculating the minimum payment in order to pay it off. It Got it. Set end date. Got it. So amortize is a form of payment, not, not a form of interest. That's like the best way to, if you had to like explain that. To it's a way of family. calculating a payment. Okay. It's a way of calculating a payment. The way of calculating payment. So now your two options are simple interest, right? Daily, and then daily compounding would be like the two easiest ways to explain this. Sure. Okay. So simple interest daily, and we got daily compounding. So for those that are listening, daily compounding interest would be like your credit card. If you if you run a balance on it and only pay the monthly minimum payment on the due date, you're gonna get charged interest on interest because you'll get compounding. Right, you'll get interest charged from last month and it gets added to the balance. Now it's your now that's your new principal balance. And then next month you're getting charged interest on that interest on your original amount that you uh, essentially ran on the card, which is why when you look at the statement and you see a thousand dollar balance and it's like, this is gonna take you 9.5 years to pay, to pay off. And you're like, how in the world is it gonna take 9.5 years to pay off such a, a low balance? That's why daily compounding, interest on interest. Versus well, to, to, clara to clarify that, if, if your credit card, um, cause I think they made the change to the rules on the credit card stuff five, five plus years ago. And I don't follow five, I don't follow credit cards all that often. But if your credit, if you get your credit card statement and it says, Hey, if you make the minimum payment, you're going to pay this off in nine and a half years. That is not compounding interest because if you had compounding interest, meaning if your interest expense for the month was a hundred and you made a minimum payment of 80, your balance is going to grow next month. You will never, you will never pay that credit card off. It will continue to increase in balance over time. Oh. If it is paying down, then you're not paying interest on interest. Does that make sense? Yes, that does. That does. Okay. Because, just, to, just to clarify. Right. And not all credit cards are created equal because I've seen certain credit cards charge a 2% minimum of the balance that would, that essentially I would assume goes to principal and then the difference is interest. So I've seen that. And then I've seen other credit cards where they only charge like maybe 1% of the balance or even less than that. And I think that's where we start to see the, the payment be one thing like $25, but the interest in that month was ninety dollars. So you didn't really do anything. I've seen this occur with like care credit, um, and I think I see this occur more with student loans. Like for example, my my soon to be wife um, is a lawyer, and she has well over six figures of student loan debt. Every single month, we go to make the payment. It it just shows the the interest, right, or something like that. But right, the the payment that they tell her to make is less than the interest or something like that. So that in that case, it would seem like, oh, there's no way this thing's ever going to get paid off. But that would but be compounding. Usually, right. And, and, and that's if you're someone that chooses the student loan payment option where they give you like the savers plan or something. If yeah, it's income based for payment. Or yeah. Whatever so when you, when you're on that, you're never paying it off essentially until you get off of that where you're actually paying a percentage amount to the principal and the amount that's going to principal is less than interest, then you're actually doing something to that. To right. that. Right. Okay. That's clear. Right. That's, that's very clear. So in the velocity banking world, what we hear, and this is even someone like myself that's done this, and this is where I've just chosen to stop doing that because I think it is misunderstanding if we're going to get to the core of, of terms, terminology, definitions, words matter, how we use those words matter. And someone like sure. you and others have helped me realize that. So when someone says simple interest versus amortization interest or amortized interest, that, that they're, what is that to you when you see that? Where is that kind of when I see surfing. coming from? You know, like when I see when I see somebody say simple versus amortized interest. Yeah, like in, in, in any of those I, videos. To, like... Yeah, so to me, we're using terms to confuse somebody because it's not a it's not a real thing. They're simple and compounded, and people need to understand that. 
and they need to understand the amortized payment and what that means. Um, but that's what I that's what I think when I see those those terms. It's kind of confusing to people, right? Yeah, you say, hey, the, your your bank loan is front loaded, and I understand that, and they're like, hey, the bank charges all the interest up front. I I get that, but okay. hey, so are HELOCs. If you look at a HELOC and you make that same minimum payment, it's going to be front loaded too. It's when you make a higher payment that it's not. Same thing on a fixed mortgage, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, that's good because that's something I personally just didn't know what I didn't know, uh, honestly. <clears throat> and so we have this this term. If we see it moving forward, this is for my audience. This this means nothing to you sure. moving forward, and it shouldn't mean anything to my audience as well. Simple versus amortized. It's not a real thing. When we also see this front loaded, this is also uh, almost irrelevant. I get where people are coming from because when they look at their mortgage payment and we, when we look at the amortization schedule, we can see that more interest is charged up front. So there is a level of truth there where there is more interest charged up front, but that's not to, to say that it just randomly is front loaded. And when you move this over to a quote unquote simple interest debt, that it's going to be any different. That's your point of view, right? Because that right, what I'm loan, saying that mortgage loan <clears throat> is simple interest, and so is your HELOC. It's it's the same. What I'm saying is, yes, you can you can look at them both as front loaded interest, depending on what the minimum payment is. Okay, depending on what the minimum payment if you is. get if you get a thirty year loan, thirty year fixed, it's going to look very front loaded because that minimum payment has been reduced to an amount right that pays it off in thirty years. Your interest is here. Mm -hmm. Okay. But if I give you a 25 year loan or a five year loan, right? The interest is going to be smaller as opposed to the total monthly payment. Right. But it's the same thing in a home equity line of credit, right? If I give you a minimum payment and I say, Hey, just pay interest only. It's severely front loaded, right? Because all of it goes to interest. But if I say, Hey, instead of uh, paying just this, let's put your whole paycheck in there. Well, now it's going to make it like it's not front loaded, but it's not really an accurate representation. It's not really apples to apples, right? It's like paying the minimum payment compared to putting your entire paycheck into into something. Right. Okay. So this is good. This, I, I think this really helps the audience. So now moving Go forward, ahead. if if someone is looking at their mortgage today and they're at a relatively you know low interest rate, maybe two or three or four percent, and then we're looking at potentially a first position HELOC. So like, say for example, someone has like a $300,000 mortgage at like a super low rate of 3%. And let's just say, you know, the original purchase price was 500K. So they're well into this 300K, let's say. They're, they're, they're far into the amortization schedule. And someone like me comes along and says, hey, you know, you could take this, go get a first lien HELOC for like $450,000 and, and, and your rate's going to be, I don't know, eight and a half percent. So that's where they're at right now. Usually and some are higher. I, I think really it's the wild, wild west because you can do a lot of research and find lower rates. This is just kind of what I see on the internet from other creators and they say, you know, move that 300 into that 450. And so now you're going to owe three. And instead of sending extra payments of a thousand dollars to this, you're going to send your whole income into here. Your thousand plus the original mortgage payment, the way that payment was, is now sitting in here. And somehow, some way, this 8.5% is going to charge less than this three. This is what we typically see on the internet, right? Yes, I disagree. But yes, that is what the concept is that. I'm not sure if people are teaching that concept or not, but they're they're saying that you can use that and pay it off faster than than paying more towards the 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 first mortgage. Yeah, honestly, I almost me personally, I almost never make videos doing this. Very rare that the, the number has to be a little bit closer. And I also really look at where they're at in the loan because if they're like ten years into that three percent thirty year loan on this 300k well for sure their their mortgage payment is probably like almost 50 percent is going to principal at that point so for me to take them out of that fixed cost and put them in into a, a variable cost there is risk there for for sure um, yeah for that scenario 1350 would be going to principal and 750 would be going to interest i like the way you ran the math there i appreciate that so now compare that to that line of credit compare right so at 300k at eight and a half percent 
depending on what their their income is. But if we're only talking like a thousand dollars in cash flow, there's really but we're just talking a, interest, right? We're just talking interest. Like, what's the interest charge for that thirty days? So if on the mortgage it's seven hundred and fifty three dollars, right? Okay. What is it on the line of credit? If I owe three hundred k for thirty days, right? If you owe three hundred k, okay. Let's see. So three hundred k. You could use you could use instead of three hundred k if you wanted to use two ninety five k and say that they they put their paycheck in there. That's okay. Yeah, but even then, it's, it, it's there's not going to be a huge difference there. And this is something that I try to get my side of the audience, my my uh, community to to kind of understand where it's sure. like where it's like guys. Um, I think we fall into this kind of illusion or facade sometimes that that this just magically is supposed to work. Now, there are other <clears throat> elements to this to this point here, but essentially they're paying $2,125 is my math on 300K interest only for 30 days at 8.5%. That's a massive jump compared to 300 grand at, at 3%. Again, if they're far into the loan, the, the, the interest has already essentially you know, been paid at that point. More often than not, I'm telling the client in that situation, I'm like, it doesn't make sense for us to remove that fixed cost and put it into a variable or, you know, risky environment, right? Mm -hmm. Now, there are some additional elements to this that I've seen and I've kind of personally practiced where they'll also say, well, in addition to getting this first lien HELOC, we're going to get a bunch of... Um, zero percent credit cards right like a bunch of them maybe it's like <clears throat> three four some on your personal maybe some on your business and we're going to extract some of that 300k and have it sit on these zero percents for you know 12 15 18 21 almost 24 months and you know we've got three four upwards of five percent balance transfer fees and essentially right. what they're doing is they're floating the debt at at zero percent for those months while they try to you know fully maximize whatever their income is and cash flow into that line and dramatically reduce that 8.5 down to say somewhere around three so now we're incorporating so, so question another level question for you yeah. If you have a balance transfer fee of 5%, is that credit card really 0% interest? It is not. And that is right. definitely, you know, a, a, a misunderstanding. So we have to be careful. We have to be careful with those when people are looking at getting 0%, um, you know, credit cards, right? Yep. Credit card companies are going to make money. They're not dumb. They know how to make money, right? Oh, for sure. But go, go ahead. Sorry. Continue. I just wanted to clarify yeah. that. So it's, it's, they're saying, we're gonna charge you 0% on whatever you move to this card for that period of time, but it cost mm -hmm. a one-time fee to move that. And then we're gonna throw <clears throat> that, we're gonna throw that fee into the amount owed. And moving forward, there's gonna be no interest charge um, for that duration. And the the hope here now is that this person knocks down the remaining of that balance tremendously where they can push whatever they owed in these cards back in there and it's going to be at a lesser cost because it's a lesser balance at this point or they rinse lather repeat they do it again they go and get another set of credit cards another set of credit cards and kind of keep it going so that's assuming this person has good credit maintains good credit maintains good discipline and actually does um you know speed up by by parking as much of their income in there as, as humanly possible so so if you had them get multiple credit cards and as you say rinse and repeat how often would they do this from what i've seen people teach or do i'm seeing it, it, it sounds like they're doing it in in a batch so maybe i see maybe they'll get two or three or four cards okay and then, and then as those expire either a they're pushing the balances back into their HELOC. And then because that same credit card is now paid off, technically, they'll, they'll get another offer in the mail. I know for me personally, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Chase, um, City, every single month they're hitting me up, letting me know how much I can do a balance transfer for. And so if I bring my credit- you got good credit. Zero, good yeah. Job. They, 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 once I bring my card to zero, I can then do it again. So I can do it again with the same card or get a new card. And so I typically, when I'm working with new clients that are coming into to my coaching practice, 
I'll sometimes see that. And they'll I love do, that you brought that up. And they'll do it on both ends. I want to talk about personal and business. I love that you brought that up. So you use a 0% credit card. You move, let's say you move 10,000 over there. You have that fee, 5%. Yes. Say you pay it off in six months. You use it again. You use that 0% credit card again, right? When you move that 10,000 over, another, a new 10,000, a new 5%. You have another 5% fee, another 5% fee, right? It's important to know that. So if you have, if you look at that mortgage where it's 3% per year, you can do the math of what that is per month, right? Over the course of, you know, two months, you know, right? Three, four months or whatever that is. So you took whatever that, whatever that was, if, if it's, so let's say it's a quarter percent per month, right? So over four months, you're paying 1% in interest. Can we agree on that? 1% of that balance is going to interest. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Right. Okay. So if we do a balance transfer at five, per, let's call it 3% instead, let's say, Hey, we're getting a better deal. If we do a balance transfer at 3%, we pay a 3% fee and we pay that off in three months, that's 3% over three months. What's the annualized cost of that? It's 12%. 12%, yeah. Way yeah. higher than 3%. And so that 0% looks really cool, but when you pair that with what the actual cost is to get it and you look at that time frame that's there, it's not so cool in my opinion. No, not at all. Not the way I've seen it be taught here. And so th these are things that, so far that we're in 100% agreement on. And I think this, in my particular space, this is where we can really do a lot of improving because this is almost butchering the concept in, in my opinion. This, this really butchers it, right? So what I'd like to do now is talk about what, what I do with my clients uh, when, when they eventually come to me because my channel's not as big as some of the other guys. Um, so typically- It's on its way. It's on its way. And honestly, the last, really since COVID, but more so the last two years, I, I personally, I've been saying that I've been running a financial clinic where, you know, I'm a coach, I'm a consultant, and I, you know, strategize over this concept. But more often than not, I'm working with clients that have been watching videos on the internet and they try to do it themselves. And then they make some horrible mistakes financially with it. And then they come to me in a, in a mess, right? So, Here's what I'm seeing, and here's where I think the concept can be quite beneficial, uh, where, where I think it outperforms other ways that people will try to pay off their debt. Because whether we like it or not, um, the, the person viewing at home, your channel, my channel, and others, they're going to end up doing what they want to do. And then when they are out of options, then they finally hit us up. And then we work with them and then we try to, you know, create some healing. So I, I got a particular case. Um, I took a photo of it just so that I can make sure I have my numbers right. I got this one client, makes great income. You know, he's making, <clears throat> making good, solid income. He's got about 11000 537 coming in expenses we clocked it on average somewhere around this number eight thousand nine sixty nine fifty and i assume it, that includes tax that counts for taxes uh co co yeah net so net take gotcha. home eleven thousand oh, gotcha. five thirty seven gotcha. net expenses okay. uh total debt six hundred thirty seven thousand seven sixty five and if my math is right they're cash flowing out the gate two thousand four sixty two now, for someone with good income, um, they have some pretty high uh, loan obligations. So I'm sure you're familiar with companies like Upstart and, and Lending Tree. These these guys are practicing usury at the highest we've ever seen. So you've got Prosper I'm as well. Sure. Uh, so this one guy, he's got like a 29% loan with Upstart and 8% over here. And I think with Prosper, it's like, well, point something. Um, I'm just going to do a couple of loans. I'm not going to show the whole situation, but I just want to get you into my world, kind of like what I'm seeing and then how I sort of uh, uh, handle this, how I go about talking to this particular person about their, their current, uh, you know, strategy, sure. what they, what they want to do to pay this off. Um, I forget, let me, I don't have the prosper information. I'm going to take that one off, but I'm going to use some of their credit cards that they have here. They really got credit cards. This is mostly America. They got credit cards, loans, car loans, personal loans, the works. It's the American way. Mm-hmm. got 23.24% there. They got 25. 
0.24% and 28.24. And we've got 5,000 owed on one, 16, seven, and 15, five. Then we've got 155 payment, 250, and 550. And then that lending is 900, and that 35K is costing <clears> them <throat> 1,134. This person does have a mortgage, right, within that 637, but they have a lot of equity in there. Is there a world when you're when you're looking at someone's financial situation like this? And I just want to uh, assume some things here that this person, you know, generally always produces a, a, a positive cash flow. They got money going into 401k, right? So mm -hmm. they are investing, they're investing in their 401k, in their Roth, in their HSA, right? They have these things, right? So they're investing, they're saving, and they're tithing. So they, they save, tithe, they invest. They still got this, you know, cash left over and, and it either... <clears throat> It either gets spent, it either maybe goes towards some more investing, some more savings, some more tithing. Uh, but they've gotten to a point where they, they've made it their their top number one goal is they want to be debt free. They want to get there as quickly as possible. Right. And then they come across my channel, other people's channel, and they're like, okay, maybe I just go get a first lien HELOC and consolidate all this and then everything will be hunky dory. <clears throat> But before they do that, hopefully they, they work with me, they talk to me, and I'm like, hmm, let's, before we go right into a first lien, could we potentially get the same result, if not better, with maybe a second position home equity line of credit? And instead of exposing ourselves to uh, a majority of this becoming variable debt, what if we did it in, in bytes, or what I like to call in, in chunk sizes? And instead of finding any HELOC out there in the marketplace where they're charging two, three percentage points above prime, what if we did extra research and found a bank that charges two, three points below prime and maybe comes with some sort of an intro rate, no closing costs, sometimes no annual fee, and so essentially no cost to get in and work with this particular tool. So assuming these things so far, right, let's say I'm able to uh, tap into the equity in their home instead of going the first lien route, we do a, a, a second lien, second lien HELOC, and they can, you know, get in the neighborhood of $150,000 because they've been, they've been pay, paying a lot to their mortgage already, right, uh, a couple of years. And they've got these other debts out here that, that's going on. Um, and if we're able to find a bank one in particular is a bank called Space Space Coast Credit Union. They're out here in South Florida. And they've got a promotion right now where it's like 12 months, no closing costs. I don't think there's an annual fee. And they'll they do zero percent or at a at a four point two four percent interest rate. Now your opinion, your thoughts so far, before I go any further, it was just a matter of being able to consolidate debt. Could this be an alternative where they use a HELOC rather than, say, a national debt relief where they tell them to stop paying on everything and then we'll negotiate a settlement, settlement their, their credit goes to, to garbage, and there's no guarantee that they'll actually help them or not. Um, you know, when you see those options out there, you know, companies like SoFi um, and, and others that promote a consolidation of debt into one central location at one lower payment fixed. And, you know, we, we see that on the radio, we see that on, on, on YouTube ads all day, every day. And, and a lot of people do this. Their credit goes to, to crap um, in order to try and get a settlement of the debt. So instead of paying what they originally owe, maybe they take off 10, 15, 20 grand or something like that. But I think about like, how are they able to do that? And where do they make their money? And I'm in, in my mind, I just look at look at what their offer is. Typically, there's origination fees, whatever their interest rate is. It's amortized over a say another ten year or so period where they can make up for all that interest that they gave back to the client by settling a, a lesser debt amount so far. So, in your in your opinion, if someone is trying to figure out how can I you know pay off my debt faster, are you do you lean more towards just looking at their cash flow and deciding which particular debt we can attack one by one in a particular order? Um, or is there a world where you say, yeah, maybe a, a consolidation of, of debt makes sense? 
What do you think so far? Uh, great question. I think the important part for people to understand is having wealth or being in financial like you know abundance, right? It's 80% psychology and 20% strategy. So right now we're talking about the 20% strategy. Yeah. But you have to consider what's the 80% psychology? What caused that debt? There's a ton of debt there, $100,000 of debt, right? If right. you put more money on that, does it solve the problem? No, it can make it worse. You got to solve the psychology issue first. Like it, now, if there's like an unexpected medical expense that came up, hey, I've, I've seen this from clients. Hey, my wife got cancer and we had to pay a hundred and something thousand to solve it. I get that, right? That's not a psychology issue. That's like just something came up and you had to take care life. of it, right? And yeah. uh, fighting for life was way more important than credit card debt, right? You'll take that every time. But if it's we're we're putting money on the credit card all the time and then we get we just keep doing this, right? And now we get to a place where we're maxed out on credit cards and it's it's solving it's taking a bunch of our cash flow now. If we go and we alleviate that cash flow, but we create a bunch of more money that's available, but we haven't solved the problem, right? It's gonna get it's gonna get worse. But let's say let's say we solve the psychology of it. Let's say we figured out what it is. We're disciplined now, and we're making these payments, and we're not ta we're not taking money out of the credit card anymore. Now, how do we solve it? Okay. Um, and and I think in something like that, yeah, there's a, there's a couple strategies. There is the one that you talked about before, where you could lose your credit and and settle for pennies on the dollar, right? And that's a strategy. I'm not saying it's one that I advocate for. I like to keep good credit, but it is a strategy. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other could be like you're suggesting where you're combining those. I think that could be a good thing if you're combining it and you're taking it from, you know, th some of those have 20% interest rate and you're combining it to something that has a lower interest rate. Yeah. Now that one that you mentioned that has an 8% interest rate, you know, sometimes that's a tough one, right? But it depends what's more important. Is it more important to save interest or are we saving cash flow? Because that one has a decent interest rate at 8% compared to what HELOCs are, but the but as far as cash flow goes, it's got a huge payment. It's nine hundred dollars, right? Mm -hmm. And so we've got to take that into consideration. Most people worry more about cash flow than they do interest, right? That's why when you go and yeah. buy a car, everybody says, here's what the payment is. Forget about what the total cost is. Just look at this one piece. So I, I think combining those into something, you know, could be a strategy as long as you're you're really disciplined and you're cautious. But you have to be aware that of what the interest rates are on home equity lines of credit. Now, I know you mentioned a moment ago, like, hey, we're going to find somebody that has a, you know, an, an introductory rate and then they charge prime minus three or, you know, whatever, all of those things. Right. Um, but the reality is, is and I'm, and I'm looking at uh, this credit union, by the way. But the reality is, is you're not going to find a company or, that has the home equity line of credit for much below prime. Why is that? Because where they get the money from right? There's a Fed funds rate. You've probably heard this whenever it's on the news. Hey, the Fed's raised the rate, raised the rate today. That's based on the Fed funds rate, right? That's right. the money that blanks, or banks borrow from each other and they borrow from the Federal Reserve, right? It's what provides liquidity for stuff, right? Okay. So if the banks get it at five and a half percent right now, Fed funds rate is a range five and a quarter to five and a half. If they, if they borrow it at that percent, they, they lend it out at prime, which is eight and a half. It's three points above the Fed funds rate. That's their spread. That's what they make, right? right. And mm -hmm. so if they're going to borrow it at five and a half and lend it at five and a half, they're not going to make any money. So you have to understand why those, how that interest rate works. And so then it kind of makes a little bit more sense. Like, hey, theoretically, it'd be awesome to go find a home equity line of credit that's 2%. just mm -hmm. doesn't exist for a long period of time. There's those Correct. intro periods in order for the banks like, hey, we're going to lose a little bit of money right now to get this as a client. It's just like when you go to the gas station and, you know, we have a big company out here that loses money on gas in order to get you to go in and buy snacks, right? Because they make money on snacks, not on gas. It's kind of the same idea. Interesting. So, so I agree with combining those if we're lowering that, yeah. that interest okay. rate. And so I, I, I like that so far. Like I like that so far. I've had conversations with people that are just like are always leaning towards like this will never make sense. Even if the rates lower, you know, the, 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 there's an underlying problem. But to your point, the 80-20 rule, let's assume this person has already dealt with the emotional traumas of their life, their mindset sure. issues, and they're now making all this progress. And now we're going to implement the 20, which is a strategy that can really yes. uh, you know, accelerate this out further. And to your, to your point, correct, there aren't many HELOCs out there that are going to charge uh, anything below the feds, feds funds rate. I've never seen that. I don't think that's possible. 
I, I've only seen it in the intro rate period. In the, in this case, yeah. Space Coast Credit Union. And just to you know, just for clarification, it was below prime. So I, right. I mentioned about how you won't find an interest rate much below prime, but not the Fed funds rate. Correct. Yeah. The the yeah. most Sorry, that I've seen a a set rate on a HELOC that's below prime is usually one percent maybe one and a half. I've never seen more than two, unless that person is maybe with a credit union, like a military or a nurse's credit union or police and fire, where sometimes they'll add on an additional discount for automatic payments, then you might see that uh, nice little healthy gap there. Point is in my particular world where I often see people promoting HELOCs at higher interest rates, when we just don't even need to be doing that, when we can get much better deals at smaller banks, local credit unions that give these interest rates. So in this example, it's 12%, zero closing costs, 4.24% for the next 12 months. What could we do in that time frame? I think a lot. And, and then when it does jump, in this case, it says 8.5% afterwards. Um, mm -hmm. By the time I get to that 8.5, what am I paying 8.5 on? You know, a, a much lesser balance than where I'm currently at, right? And in this case, we're dealing with roughly, I, I want to say almost $100,000 of debt. So if you do 35,000 <clears> plus the 13,5 plus the 5,000, 16,7. And then we have fifteen five. So it's eighty five thousand seven hundred dollars of consumer debt. Where if I have one hundred fifty thousand dollars of space, what I teach my clients, <clears throat> I, I sort of have a uh, what's called a chunk range, and I tell them, you know, if if I had access to one hundred fifty grand in my HELOC, I'm not going to borrow more than two thirds of the uh, available credit. So I create this chunk range and i usually say two-thirds or 66 percent so in that case i think it's ninety thousand or something and then i take their cash flow and i times it by 12 and i say look whatever we chunk ideally i don't want to put more than 12 months of future cash flow at this supposed risk that I'm I got to be taking on, right? Because I am leveraging debt, so there's inherent risk in in leveraging. So, how do I create some sort of leverage rules around here? And, and this is what I've been able to establish with some clients. So, at 150 grand times, yeah. So that was 99,000, and then cash flow times 12 is 29,550. So I tell them. All right, if we were to chunk and sort of do what a national debt relief or a SOFI would offer us and have to pay all their fees and whatnot, we, you know, comparing to that, this is way better because I get around the fees and I'm at a lower rate and I can essentially consolidate all these higher interest rates into a lower interest rate and I can control, I <clears throat> would say I can control this rate, this whatever variable rate, I can control it much uh, easier with all this income because now I have the ability to park this income into this line and start to make that, that, that difference. And then if we look at, all right, well, how much cash flow is recovered in, in that process? And this is the second part as I tell them to count, you know, add up how much cash flow are we recovering when we do this move does it get us, you know, near that um, that eighty five thousand number of the amount of debt? So two thousand nine hundred and eighty nine dollars is the, you know, new cash flow. These are payments no longer going out. These are that's money that's going to be sitting in the HELOC now for the next, you know, duration of how long, however long we keep this. So now it's two thousand nine eighty nine plus my existing cash flow. Now I'm at five thousand four fifty one fifty times twelve. Now I'm at sixty. 5,000. So that's a lot closer to that chunk amount of the 85. So that's one option is what I, you know, let this client know. I said, look, we're within the chunk range. I don't think we're over leveraging if I borrow more than 99,000. I also don't think we're under leveraging at 65. We're kind of in the middle, not too bad. Still plenty of uh, space there. But if we wanted to make this even less riskier, we could handle this in in bites and essentially get the same or, or similar result is what i educate clients on and that's where i kind of let them make the decision where you can make the argument well 
the faster I get that money in here, the less interest I pay. And, and yes, that's technically true because you're moving everything to a lower rate. So in that example, that would be true. Um, but there's this little thing called life that happens. As you mentioned earlier, someone gets sick, you know, or someone loses their job. You were, you weren't, you were only obligated to these payments, right? And if I lose my job and I need time to, re to recover and I kind of leveraged too much, well, now I'm out of a job and I owe this in one location, one payment now, yes, that does help, I guess, from a psychology standpoint. Uh, but now they're going to be forced to borrow more money um, if they don't have other means, like other cash. And th in this example, they do have savings, roughly three to six months worth of expenses. So we don't really have to tap into that. But these are the two options that I end up really, uh, you know, presenting at this point to my clients, my audience, and kind of showing them, you know, there are scenarios where this strategy can make sense. But to your point, I think there is that emotional or psychological standpoint that must get fixed because if their original problem was spending, their original problem was spending more than what they make, um, you know, some people, I honestly, I don't know if you experienced this, but there are people out there that just like, I don't want to say they like to suffer or they like to be in debt, but it's what they know. It's what they know because their mom and dad was in debt their whole life. They were in debt their whole life. Their kids are in debt their whole life. So it's just what they know. So the moment they win the lottery or the moment they get a cash windfall, they'll pay everything off and they go right back into debt again, even though, so I don't know if you've seen this before. I've witnessed this at, at high magnitudes or I, I helped a client. Yes. I help the client pay off all their debt within three years or less, including their mortgage. And then they got a first lien HELOC for like over half a million dollars and they threw it into a real estate syndication, like the whole thing. They just completely ignored all my rules and all my different things. And this is me learning as a coach as well, where in that particular conversation, we really didn't discuss too much about mindset, about you know how we got here in the first place. So when I saw that happened, I went back to the drawing board. I was like, okay, how can I address these questions on future client, new client calls? Because it, it, it wasn't the strategy that got them out of debt. It was like really just their pure will. But even getting out of debt, it, it wasn't enough for them. Like they went back to their norm. They were debt free. Well, and some people, when they have so much debt and so many monthly payments and they're struggling, they've got these shackles on, right? They've got mm -hmm. these handcuffs on. And if they don't take that time and learn, then, you know, once those come off, once those handcuffs come off, right? Because it's easy to not go out and acquire a new debt when you don't qualify. But when those come off and now all of a sudden you qualify and if that problem's not solved, yeah, you go, you go right back. Um, there's a couple of things that I wanted to speak to about kind of what you, what you just said. And there's, there's, there's some of it that I agree with as far as combining those things, taking it to a lower interest rate loan. I think that could be a good strategy. But two things, I'm, I'm assuming that this person's credit score, it's not going to be at the top, okay? Now, um, if, if they're making all their payments on time, it could be decent, but if you've got large balances on your credit cards, and I'm assuming that they're probably getting close to the limit, your score can drop pretty low. You can get into the 500s have never had a late payment. It's possible. I've seen it many times, right? Interesting. So you're probably going to be in that mid-600 mid, mid range. Okay. Now, um, that's going to affect a lot of that interest rate on the home equity line of credit. Because home equity lines of credit, they're looking for better interest rates, right? Yeah. Why? Because when it goes to foreclosure, home equity lines of credit typically don't get any of their money back, depending on where you're at on the first mortgage, right? So you got to be careful there. Um, the other thing is you mentioned about, you know, what would happen like if they lose their job. And here's the thing, and this is a big one, right? If you have all that credit card and you credit card debt and you lose your job, it's treated different if you stop making those as opposed to all that money being on the line of credit and you stop making that. Why? Right? If you stop making the credit card payments, you lose your credit. If you stop making the home equity line of credit payments, you lose your home. Two mm -hmm. completely different things. Yeah. So you have to be aware of what that is and you have to be be really, really cautious there because you don't yeah. want to get into a position where you're losing your home because you had something happen. So I like that this particular client that you have, you said, Hey, we got three to six months of emergency. That can get you out of most financial emergencies. Yeah. Right. So I think that's key to having that if you're going to do something like that. Yeah. So in, in my particular practice, uh, over the years, I haven't done this from day one, this is me learning, but over the last couple of years, I've been more adamant on 
before we just jump into this strategy and, and try to run before we crawl and walk, I try to see what investments they have, what, li what liquidity they already have, what capital, what savings, tithing are we giving, are we not, that sort of thing. Kind of get that baseline settled first, have those emotional conversations. How did we get here in the first place? Was this just bad luck or was this intentional or was this unintentional and you just ignoring I have a problem spending money and so can we address that first and I think it's possible to address these things while being in debt still so I think there's some great I, I think there's people out there or coaches I've seen where it's like until they're debt free the problem's not you know fully gone or whatever so sometimes I think there's we can make that distinction where it's like someone can quit drinking but still have you know opportunity around them to, to do so, but them not go to it because they're going to AA meetings, they're doing this, they're now going to church, and it's a constant, you know, pushing away of these opportunities to go back into drinking, or in this case, back into debt. So I kind of make that comparison sometimes. And there's also, to the point, like we lose our job, the flip side of the argument, in my world, what, what we typically say is, hey, if you lose your job and you have this HELOC and you have all this credit, all this equity, um, granted, hopefully we also have some savings, but let's say you burned through that three to six months of savings, you also have this HELOC and we don't necessarily um, have to, like just randomly we stop making payments, you can actually withdraw from the HELOC and back in and that counts as a payment for that month and we're just covering interest assuming we're in the um the revolving period which is usually the first five ten years so there's no um, principal payment required typically it's just interest only there are HELOCs that are principal and interest of course yes but for the ones that are interest only you could you can make the argument now that this person if they were to move a good amount of their debt into this HELOC and they're doing velocity banking and they're off to a great start and they've got all this cash flow now back into their economy, then they lose their job. Not only do they have the three to six months of expenses, but they also have this other gap. And what I've had clients do is they'll dump their savings into their HELOC to sort of mm -hmm. buy time and they kind of live out of the HELOC. So almost like a reverse HECM, reverse, reverse mortgage or like a, a home equity conversion mortgage, kind of similar to that, but without the obligation. Um, and, and they'll buy themselves more time until they can get back to uh, working again. Right, where they're making more. You're, 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 so like the flip side. You're saying that if they have money in savings, you would have them put that in the line of credit. I don't to free up more. I don't typically tell them do this. I will show them the option where I'm like, look, you're gonna spend that money anyways, right? We're we're jobless, so we no longer have income coming in. Let's say that was their only income stream, and you have this three six months worth of money in a savings account mm -hmm. for this for the sake of satisfying the payment on the HELOC. Now that we've removed those other debts, in this case, let's just say all he has left is the mortgage payment and and the HELOC, and we have no income coming in, uh, and all we have is those three to six months worth of expenses. Either. In one shot, we move all that savings into the HELOC or month by month, you would move money from your savings into the HELOC to essentially buy time. You're satisfying the payment of the HELOC and then you're simply withdrawing that money again to cover your bills, pay your mortgage payment, keep everything up to date. And I would say that that's something I would personally do. If, if I lose my income, a, a big source of income, I'm gonna park cash uh, month by month or in one lump sum into my HELOC because it's it satisfies the payment instantly uh, for that month. And I can then reaccess that money again to pay another bill. And all I'm doing, and I'm not trying to live like that my whole life, but in that period of lack of income, lack of say opportunity to whatever the case may be, I have seen certain clients buy themselves an extra two, three, four months without having anything go late, without having any uh, damage to their credit and without having to increase debt in another location like a credit card with, with high interest or personal loan. So that's typically- okay. You know how, how I draw that distinction there. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, it does absolutely. And there's there's another piece of it that I'd like to give you. Um, I I think that's really risky, and I'll tell you why. So when you have when you have an open ended line of credit where you can draw from it, that creditor at any time can close that account so that you can't draw from it anymore. 
if you go late on another account, that's one thing they'll do it, uh, where they'll they'll do it, they'll, they'll they'll close it. So if you take all of your savings that you have and you put it in there and you're saying, hey, I have access to this now, I understand that strategy. Yeah. But what are you gonna do if that bank says, hey, wait a minute, we need to close this account? Because there's many reasons that can come up where they can close the account, right? We saw a lot of this in 08, 09, 2010 as the market dropped, right? All these lines of credit. Yeah. closed right and so you have to be really careful with that with that strategy okay. the other thing that i would consider is you know this is it's going to depend on how long you're out of work right and a lot of times you don't know this right i mean i think right. if you're if you're hustling you're trying to figure it out right away you're you know if you're determined right another psychology one right if you're determined you're you're probably going to get something pretty quickly mm -hmm. if you're not you know maybe something else happened family related where you're you know you're just kind of down in the dumps a little bit and it's going to take you a while you know, I, let's say I'm going to exaggerate here. Let's say you're out of work for two years, right? Well, now I struggle with the idea of using your equity to pay off those credit cards. It's a hard one, right? Do we use 150,000 of equity to pay off those credit cards? And then over jobless? the course of three years? Yeah. I mean, no, I don't no. know. That's, a, that's, that's a, that's a tough one, right? If you're, well, if you're, we'll, all, we'll you're going to be off for that. a few years, you're, you're probably better to, you know, you're probably better to file a bankruptcy and start over. I, I, I don't like advocating for people to file a bankruptcy, but there's a place for it. Right. Uh -huh. And, and, you know, the bankruptcy is going to hurt your credit yeah. for depending on uh, what you do two to four years, right. It's going to hurt it longer for credit cards, but you know, you can, you can get another mortgage after two years, maybe four, depending on the loan program. Right. It's not that bad. Um, I mean, it's bad, but it's not that bad. But you know, if I, I think what you're saying there could be a decent strategy, if it's like, Hey, we've got a, we've got a few months off, right. Where we've got to figure something out. But I also think that's what that three to six month, you know, cushion is for, you know what I mean? So I'd be careful putting that in there, but if it's going to be an extended period of time, then hold on, might not make sense to use the equity to pay, make payments. And you know what I mean? I yeah. want to see people over the course of time, maintain as much of that equity and as much of that net worth as they possibly can. Right. And sometimes you got to make tough to choices. One of those being bankruptcy. I've had clients that have done it, you know, on the mortgage end where they've, you know, gotten overextended and they filed bankruptcy. And, you know, a few years later they're back and they're great. I've had other clients who have done that. And a few years later, they're back in the same position. Right. So it's so good I to know all the options. Yeah, it is. And for someone like yourself that's been in the mortgage industry, I'm very interested if you spend some time on the, maybe on the law side or, or have seen some legislation come out out of 08, now moving forward in 2024, as it relates to that point where the bank at any time can call, freeze, or cancel your second lien HELOC and, and first lien HELOC. Can the same be said about someone's fixed mortgage or is there, or is that somewhat treated differently in, in that space? Well, great, great question. I appreciate you asking. Um, you can't really close down a first mortgage because it's all, the money's already out. The money's already out. Right. So the money's can... already out. You're, you're, you're paying it back. So the bank isn't going to say, Hey, we're going to stop accepting payments. It's when you're drawing money from there, right? So on your HELOC, you have a draw period. Most of them have a 10 year draw period. It's during yes. that period when if the bank gets uncomfortable, because again, they're in second position, right? If it goes to foreclosure, they get hurt. First even position, they're going to be better. Even on a first right? lien, even on a first lien HELOC or just, you're just referring first to the second lien right now. First position, they're going to be better, okay. right? Second position, it depends. If the person has tax liens and things like that. Second position, they may not get anything. So they are really cautious. Right. So if you're like, if you've got that open equity line of credit where you can go in there and draw money at any time, uh, they can, they can shut that off and say, Hey, wait, something's up. We can't let this person take more money out. Okay. That gotta be careful. Yeah. I would like to go over those scenarios, those potential scenarios when the sure. bank can, can do this. Now, from what I've read online, it's typically when you miss a payment, have a late payment. Yep. Or when you over leverage the line itself, meaning if you had the 150K HELOC and you borrowed 150,000 and maybe you're only paying interest payments and then you miss a payment and then they, I've, I've heard stories. I've never had a client actually get their HELOC uh, canceled, frozen or, or called at any, at any point. Okay. I haven't seen that. Um, mm -hmm. But you've been around much longer than I have. So in 2007 and eight, that occurred. A lot of people got their HELOCs frozen, I don't want to say canceled, but they were called in that case. And when, when, a, when a HELOC gets called, that means you owe it all at once. Or is there some they usually kind of freeze? They usually freeze the line. Right. They just freeze it typically, right? Yeah. Or they or they um they cap the credit limit. They just won't give you more credit. Um so in today's environment, have we seen more protection for the consumer? Let's say that particular consumer is someone that's not leveraging 
more than 50, 60% of their line. Payments are made on time. Everything else is good. Let's say in that scenario, what would be some additional things that would cause a bank to close that person's particular line of credit because when they when a bank closes a person's line or freezes it i don't think they're just blanket to everyone it seems like they do it in a in a sort of um let's eliminate the worst people first and and keep the good borrowers because i think that exists i i don't know maybe i'm well good question um you know the last six months and each area in the country is going to be a little bit different to this but what have you seen happen to the housing market in the last six months in the last six months, um, I haven't yeah. really been paying attention. I'm assuming real estate is, is either going up still or has it yeah. finally uh, peaked? Because in South Florida, I don't know, we're still seeing prices increase. I mean, I just bought a home sure. um, and on December uh, for 630000 but I'd be willing to bet that this property has probably appreciated since because there's just been a lot of purchasing in, yeah. in the area. So year Help, help me out. I don't year over it. yeah, no problem. So year over year, it's up about three to four percent, depending on the area, right? Some are going to be higher, some are going to be lower. Okay? okay, but month over month, for you know probably the last four or five months, some areas have actually seen a decline, a dip, okay. right? Nothing huge, but they've seen a little bit of a of a dip, right? And now we're starting to enter the buying season, so it's likely to go back up, right? There's some inventory issues, there's some other things that are that are kind of supporting it. <laughs> um, but that's one of those where if the value of your home drops, that's one where they would freeze your line of credit. Okay, good point. Now, there are some people, depending on which channel you watch, that believe the housing market is going to drop 50% in the next year. And they've been right, predicting right. this every year for the last five or six years. <laughs> right. It's it hasn't time. happened, right? But and they're hey, having I don't, I don't millions shut those guys of views. Out. Always. I know. I don't <laughs> shut those guys out, though, because I'm like, I'm hearing Kiyosaki say it day in and day out and, and, uh, and, and all these big guys. But, I, you know. So I, I'm, I'm not aware of, of legislation that prevents um, them from closing down a line of credit camp. I, I can't say that's something that I look into. You know, that would be something if I were, you know, for your audience who's getting a line of credit, you can ask, hey, what happens? What, under what scenarios will you freeze my line? Is it open-ended? Can you choose regardless? Or are there specific things that you have to, you know, that specific reasons that you can use to freeze it and that's it right it's important because to know. because i'm i'm thinking practically the bank doesn't have access to all of my financial information but if i have my primary heloc at the same bank where my primary checking is and the bank sees deposits and they see withdrawals and they you know and as long as i don't have my checking account go insufficient funds i would think that would be a potential reason why they would look at my heloc and they see the balance rising and rising. They're like, wait a minute, why is he having all these non-sufficient funds in his, in his checking account? Maybe that could be a reason I've gone over that with clients before. I've talked to them about the value of the home dropping dramatically, which is why when I go for a second lien HELOC, I try not to tell them to, to get as much as you can. Um, I usually tell them, like, let's just get what we need to do what we're trying to accomplish with the current debts that we have. Um, because if we have a, a $500,000 home and, and we owe three and you're only making five, seven grand a month, um, do we really need a uh, $150,000 line? Or do we really only need about a forty to $50,000 line? In that case, my value of my home has to drop more than a hundred thousand or more before it even gets close to the available equity in the line. So I'm, I'm curious to know in that example, 500,000 is the value of the home. I owe three. Let's say I have a HELOC for a hundred credit limit. So there's an additional mm-hmm. hundred thousand of equity there. Let's just say, and my value of my home drops to 400,000. Would that give the bank reason to now freeze my hundred thousand dollar HELOC because it's no longer a uh, 90% LTV? as it was originally, or maybe 80, would that be a, a, a potential reason? Or does it have to drop more where it actually dips into the available credit of my line? Like, let's say the property drops to 300 and, uh, no, sorry. Yeah, 390,000. Okay. So now, yeah, if you want to explain that a little bit. So if it drops to 390,000 and you still have some equity, here's the thing to think about, is if the bank takes over the property, let's use 400,000 to be, just to make numbers a little easier. Um, but if the bank takes over the property and it has to foreclose, how much do they get of that 400,000 at auction? What does it sell for on average? Ed- educate us. Cause I think there's a world where yeah. 
it costs the bank it, it's, to, to do a it's foreclosure. about 80 per yeah it's it's very expensive 20 30 thousand right and then it costs it's they sell it uh for about 80 percent or 80 cents on the dollar so if you're a bank and somebody has a loan um, an open-ended line of credit so they've got three hundred thousand on the first mortgage a hundred thousand on the second mortgage and they had all this equity and you start seeing that drop are you going to wait until it gets to here when you owe what it's worth because what happens on your hundred thousand dollar line of credit if it goes to foreclosure it's gone so, so what right would... so so that can as that drops that can that can be something where they're like hey we're, we're not going to wait until you get to where you owe more than what it's worth we might okay. cut it off sooner i don't know that there's a rule of a rule of thumb on that um for banks but i know you know they're watching they're they're watching for it. they're paying attention to property values they're paying attention to what's going on with your other accounts you know if they're on time or not other accounts yeah i mean they, they can't them. pull my camp they can't pull my credit randomly absolutely they can so banks can pull it's your credit stock. It's called a soft. It's called a soft pool. They'll monitor. They'll monitor your credit. Look, if you if you go late on a credit card, you know what happens to your other credit cards? You suddenly get something in the mail, and it's like, hey, uh, you know, a lot of times they'll freeze it. Hey, you're going late on these payments, and so we're freezing the line. Interesting. It's happened. I've seen. I've seen plenty of clients that have had that have that situation. So they have the ability to monitor through soft pools and see what's going on. And a lot of people will sign up through credit monitoring through their bank as well, so they'll be able to see what's there. I mean, banks have to protect their assets, right? You're right. It's just how it is. Okay. So I want to, I want to stay on this cause this is very helpful. So in that example, $500,000 value, sure. home, 300 K O credit limits, a hundred thousand persons employed. They're working, right? Yeah. They're rocking and rolling. Things are doing good. They're doing velocity banking. Let's say they owe 50 on the line. So they technically owe 350 altogether. And then the value of the home starts to drop to 400,000, you were talking about foreclosure. So that would assume that the person can't afford the payments any longer. So let's say they can, okay. right? Let's say they're employed, value of their home drops to 400 grand. Um, at this point, I'm pretty sure if something like that happens, there's a global, you know, United States issue going on. Everyone's aware. So you're saying that a bank might call what? The HELOC first? They would probably freeze the line probably freeze a line prior to this mm -hmm. going to 400,000. Like if they see this, you know, just boom, going down pretty quickly, you're saying that the bank is looking at a perfectly good borrower and they're gonna, you know, they're gonna cut that off potentially. They could, they, they could. could. And Once it, a perfectly good borrower doesn't mean always a perfectly good borrower, right? And in Look this at that example, back in, back in, back in 08, 09, 2010, there were a lot of people that had 740 credit scores that suddenly found themselves with a 540 credit score. Right. Happens. So in, in this example here, um, again, the great borrow, great, you know, person's got good income, someone like this, you know, plenty of cash flow, they pay all their stuff on time, nothing random, nothing weird going on in, in their accounts. Is it a random notification in the mail or is there some sort of warning 30 days, 60 days? Hey, Denzel Rodriguez, we regret to inform you that in the next, you know, 30 days, 60 days, um, you will no longer have access to your account or is it like instant one day I log in and then I, I can't withdraw money? Great question. So from those that I've seen, it's an instant thing. It's an instant thing. They, they've received a letter and it makes sense. Hey, you have hundred thousand available in your line of credit. We're going to freeze it in. 30 days. Hint, hint, go take it all out. Right. Ah, okay. The reason why the bank is freezing it is because they don't want to lose it. There's something that changed. There's something that came up and they don't want to lose money. So they're not going to be like, Hey, just so you know, we're going to take it in 30 days. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's usually, you know, from what I've seen, the clients that I've had that have had that happen, um, it's been, they just get a letter. Hey, it's, it's done. Gotcha. And that's typically on Thanks, second, kind of that's typically on a second lien. Now on a first lien mortgage, yep. is it a little bit different? I mean, a first lien HELOC. Uh, you know, great question. I don't, I don't know that. Um, I wouldn't imagine that it could be cause it's kind of the same scenario there. Right. So it, it is true that if it goes to foreclosure, they're more likely to get paid on a first position, depending on what LTV they go to. Um, but still same thing. They can lose money as the, if values drop. And, and the same could be said. So now if we put the second lien HELOC aside, and if we're just talking mm -hmm. first lien HELOC and first lien mortgage, um, properties drop at that point, since it's a first lien line, all they would do is simply cut off the revolving feature of that line and just simply require payments, not require me to pay the whole thing back. Yeah. Typically what I've seen is when there are issues with the property uh, or issue with the property value, they've freeze the lines. I mean, you know, you got to understand like banks don't want to foreclose. It's a, it's a, 
an extremely expensive process. They don't want to foreclose. They don't want, they just want you to make a monthly payment. So the, the, the chance of them calling the whole thing due is very, very rare. It would be different if there were fraud. If right. there's fraud, they're probably going to call it due. Mm -hmm. Um, but other than that, they, you know, if, if somebody's making the payment on time and you freeze the line and you just call it due, you have a chance of putting that person into foreclosure. They don't want the, they don't want the foreclosure. They don't want it to happen. It's too expensive. Right. They're going to lose more money if they do that, right? So, so usually they'll just freeze the line and say, "Hey, make the payment. This is what we want. Make the payment." Yeah. So, they, you know, they may they may remove the interest only portion of it and they may set it to where sure. there's a certain amount to pay it off. Right. Um that I don't that I don't know. Um you know, that's something if if people are concerned about it, that's something asking whoever you're taking the line of credit from because you've got to know. So then in that regard, I mean, it's not like from what we've seen, it's not like, especially I think in today's environment, if we do see a real estate crash, a market crash, it's not like no one's going to know it was coming because of all these, because of social media and the news, it seems like even the common person would, would have pre-knowledge of, of what's going on. So what I've informed my audience and, and clients is, hey, if we are to see another COVID event if or, or similar to a 07, 08, and we're starting to hear the signs and, and the, hearing the news and the noises, then it would be wise for us to consider dialing it, dialing it a few notches back, maybe not leverage even more than a third of our line. Like let's not leverage even maybe at all for this period just mm -hmm. to kind of wait and see what the what the market does you know we got elections coming up we've got all these content creators saying major crash on the way and you know we're just hearing a lot of things we're hearing world war three right we're hearing a lot of stuff so maybe for someone who's brand new and looking at potentially dual velocity banking maybe now maybe now maybe not the right timing. I think there's a place where, where this can obviously uh, be a better fit um, and, and can you know cause some speed and acceleration. But I'm also in the camp, and I think like you, where it's like, hey, it's okay when this doesn't work and we can just maybe not pay off debt. I, mean, I think you alluded that to that earlier where you're like, let me go invest money instead of pay my mortgage off early. Do you lean more towards that sometimes? Some content creators talk about that where it's like you, you have a, you fixed the, the dollar in your mortgage, the cost of that dollar is fixed. So you've kind of inflation proofed your cost of living over the next 30 years on that primary, you know, why pay that off now when we can go put dollars to work, depreciating dollars to work and try to get compound interest. Right. Um, great, great question. And that's probably something I can talk about for hours, but I'll, I'll try to keep it, uh, I'll try, try to keep it short. Yes, I, I am big on investing that money instead uh, for a couple of different reasons. Um, Charlie Munger said something that, Hey, get to that first hundred thousand. Right. Uh, he said, it's a, it's a pain to get there, but get to that and everything, everything changes. Um, so for me, I believe, I believe in that your psychology changes when you get to that point. Right. And then it grows, it grows much faster and we can't save our way to being a millionaire. It doesn't work. Right. You have to, you have to invest it. So I full disclosure, I do have a mortgage. I can write a check and I can pay it off. I choose not to. Why? I'm on average, depending on my investments, I got over 20% last year, right? The market got over 20%. And I do some private money deals that are kind of much higher as far as that goes. My mortgage, my interest rate is 2.75. So if we're looking at it from an interest, does it make sense to take a chunk of my money that I'm getting investments from and putting it toward there? No. So what I did instead is I take a, a portion of that money and I invested it and that actually makes my mortgage payment. So I have a mortgage, but I don't have a mortgage payment, if that makes sense. My parents, we did the same thing. They actually moved next to me, which is kind of, which kind of cool. They moved there a couple of years ago. Um, so I can check on them. Anyways, they did the same thing, right? When they sold their house, they used to live about four hours from me. And then when they moved uh, next door, they sold their house, they had all this equity. They said, Hey, what was the first thing you think to do? Let's put that down onto the, the mortgage and get a smaller mortgage, get a smaller mortgage payment, right? Because so it's manageable. Instead, what they did was they worked with the guy who manages my money. His name's Travis, my financial advisor, invested that. That covers the entire payment and then actually gives them a little extra money up monthly, right? So it's a different, it's a different strategy. So I'm a big advocate for that. But you got to be smart, right? You can't, yeah. there, you, you, you can make some bad decisions when it comes to investing and and yeah, lose that money, but you can make some bad decisions when it comes to the HELOC too, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. I just prefer to go to that, go that route instead yeah. of paying off the mortgage. I like that. Right. And that's, I, I, I've touched on that a little bit. I don't claim to be this know-it-all investor on my channel. I'm still brand new. I just bought my first home and I acquired it using- Congrats. It. Thank you. 
and I acquired it using a first lien HELOC. So I, I have a first lien HELOC and I'm, you know, dumping my income in and parking in there and I'm seeing the, I've only paid about $4,500 in interest and over the last like three months uh, from, yeah, December 21st till now, it's March. Uh, we're, in, we're like towards the end of March as we're recording this. So I'm, I'm seeing the value there, but I'm also seeing that if I had the option a couple years back to maybe go with a two, three, percent mortgage, I might have done that. I can I can be honest and I say I might have done that instead of the first lien. Um if if I was gonna practice your strategy of sending that money into the marketplace uh or if I'm gonna invest it in an area where I know that I, I can kind of be involved and multiply that money. Um if someone doesn't have that confidence, then would you say potentially it might make sense to target a, a payoff a mortgage to not have that payment later on if it meant being able to pay it off within five to seven years or are you still like almost always just invest the difference or do you measure depends on what your it depends on what your goals are what's important to you okay so okay some people it's important to have that was a good coaching answer gotcha so you you come from that (laughs) you come from that perspective where it's like you don't answer it answer for Um, the client you let them come to the conclusion themselves rather than we influence that decision. Well, I, I can tell people what I would do. I okay. can tell people what I do, but it doesn't ne- necessarily mean that it works for them, right? It's just what, what I right. did. Um, and I've had various mentors and, and coaches over, over time that have helped me, you know, form those things. So it, it, it depends on what's most important. Some people, the most important thing in their life is to look at their mortgage statement and have a zero. Yeah. And I get that. <laughs> for me, the most important thing for me is freedom. freedom. Okay. And so what I, what I mean, what I mean by that is I want to make sure that my expenses are covered. If I want to take a month off, I can I actually did this. I took the month of December off and used that whole December to help some nonprofit organizations. And it was freaking awesome. But anyways, so freedom is more important to me than the zero. If the zero is important to you, then yeah, do everything you can to pay that, pay that down and pay it off. And that's fine. Right. If it's not, and you're like, Hey, I want to get to a place where this payments, maybe it's there, but it's made and I don't have to worry about that. And I don't have to work my nine to five and to, in order to, to, to make that payment. Um, then, you know, there's other strategies out there that can be better. Go out and learn them all before you do one. There's a ton of them, right? Yeah. So I, mine is just cover those, get, get those payments covered, have freedom. I want to be very respectful of your time. I know we're almost at the two hour mark here as we're recording. It's just been flying. We really yeah. covered a lot fun. today. Fun. Um, no one threw any punches. Uh, that that's pretty cool. You know, we were very nice. Uh, we were able to dialogue. And again, I, I want other content creators out there that, you know, want to have discussions like this or even clients, people, you guys are listening, watching to kind of open up your, your mindset a little bit more. I think we've been able to, uh, really uncover some things in my particular world, bossy banking world, where there's some misrepresentation going on. And I think it just literally has to do with us not knowing what we don't know. There's, there's that. I don't think, this is me being naive, I, I don't think there's people being malice intent. Um, there's only so much you can do with velocity banking to kind of like force it to work or kind of manipulate the numbers. It, it, it's kind of hard to manipulate the numbers. Um, you can, I guess, influence someone like, oh, just, you know, move your money into this HELOC and everything's gonna be okay. You know, <laughs> I, I, I think for those that are listening, if you're working with someone that's teaching you this concept and they're not going through all the steps and running through all the possible scenarios, then you may want to take two steps back and see if that's something you really want to do. And I, I want to wrap up with a question here as to what your favorite debt elimination strategy is, right? I'll ask you that. For me, obviously, I'm going to go with velocity banking, but I've gone to the point where I actually incorporate a multitude of debt elimination strategies. So for example, I'll have someone where we start off with debt elimination. We're just looking at the smallest debt and then trying to create some momentum. And then I'll teach them about cash flow index. Where I'm like, hey, it's sometimes not always about the balance, but it's maybe sometimes more about the cash flow than it is the interest rate. So sometimes we just need to get to the cash flow faster. So I show them cash flow index. And then very rarely I do debt avalanche, which focuses on on interest first. Uh, but sometimes people like paying off the highest interest debt. Uh, and sometimes that can that can sometimes be better. But I like to measure all four strategies, cash flow, debt snowball, debt avalanche, velocity kind of put them all together. And what I really love to do is say, hey, maybe there's a world where we do 
that snowball, we get a nice line of credit, we do a little velocity banking, we get a little speed, and then we turn it off and snowball the rest of the way because when we look at an amortization debt like a mortgage, if we can get ahead of that front interest, if we can get, if we can get past that load of interest in the beginning, then the rest of the payments is all a uh, majority of it being principal. So the last thing I want to do is take that payment and stick it into a high interest line and then try to play that game and manipulate it when maybe I could have just fully maximized you know, the concept of the HELOC method or the PLOC method or credit card method to its maximization. It's like, boom, it's fully optimized. Okay, now stop. And then we snowball it the rest of the way. I've seen people do that and they get tremendous results because again, less riskier um, mm -hmm. and we don't have to expose ourselves to such a big variable of uh, uh, debt uh, unless we want to, unless we have other goals. Like in my case, I don't intend to necessarily pay off my mortgage, my first lien HELOC early I'm just putting a lot of capital in there because once I get it down to a certain point, I want to be able to invest it again. So it's like that liquidity or that speed. I feel like that gives me an upper hand. Um, and I feel like that gives me a jump start. Whereas the amount of time it would take me to save it, so to speak, uh, versus being able to leverage and use that money wisely and be a good steward. So that's kind of like where I land. But uh, as we get to ready to kind of close out here, I wanted to ask you, what's your favorite debt elimination strategy and and you know when you're talking to folks what kind of like your go-to method where it's like this is tried and true usually has a good success rate and then how Great you question. and then how you graduate people to thinking differently about hey instead of debt elimination how do we invest the difference of that cash flow and then have the freedom to write a check at any point but we have options right in, right. in your case yeah, so it, it's funny if you if you know if you ask a financial advisor, they would always always tell you to pay the highest interest rate thing first. Mm -hmm. um, Dave Ramsey's method is to pay the lowest thing first because it kind of takes into consideration the human psychology. Like, hey, we we got something right, let's keep going. Right. So I understand I understand both of those sides. Um, if I don't have debt, but um, the one thing that I've seen, you know, that's worked a lot from from clients is I'm not opposed to doing the fixed rate second mortgages. I'm not a big fan of cash out more, you know, first mortgages. There's a lot of that that I'm that I'm not a fan of. I mean, if it, I always tell people like, if if you're struggling and things are tight, um, it's better to do something sooner rather than later. If you're going to do like a cash out, whether it's a first mortgage or second position, you know, second HELOC, um, or or I'm sorry, second uh, fixed rate second mortgage. But I, I prefer things that are fixed. I prefer things that have a, a fixed. Uh, a fixed payment. I'm not a big fan of the open-ended because of the. I think there's risks that are there. Um, and then I like the idea of making the minimum payments on things um, and then investing the difference. It's like even with people in you know auto loans. I know a lot of people like to say, "Hey, I'm going to pay an extra two hundred dollars toward my auto loan and get that knocked off." Right? And I understand the the strategy behind there. But here's what I've seen in, in being in the mortgage industry for twenty years. 23 years um, and thousands and thousands of, of, of loans, uh, what happens is the second people pay off a car loan, you know what they do? Oh, hey, we need a new car. Let's get a new one. They go right back in the debt, right? Yeah. So that's why I like to say just instead of that 200, just invest that. And every, you know, if you keep doing that over time, I mean, you're going to have, my, my kids already have thousands of dollars put away in their investment account and they're 12 and 14, right? It's because it's the same thing. So if we keep doing that, once we get to where we have some money there, we we, we look at the world different. We take different jobs, right? We carry ourselves different. Everything is, everything is different. So, um, I'm, I'm a big advocate for structuring the debt, making so that it's something so that it's manageable. Um, but starting an investment account as soon as possible, because time, you know, the more time you have in the market, the more time you have investing, the better off you're going to be. If you spend all your time getting out of debt and after 20 years, you're debt free and you have nothing invested, life's still going to be challenging. You've oh, still yeah. got to work, right? Because mm -hmm. social security, even if your house is paid off, social security isn't going to give you much to live on, right? So, so I like the other way, let's get the debt, let's make it manageable. Let's invest as much, as much as we can. And if you're doing that over the course of 20 years, you won't have any issues. I see. I like that. I like that a lot. My, my grandpa Dave would be spinning right now, uh, hearing what you just said. <laughs> so there's definitely the Dave Ramsey community right. that are like, what? This guy just took a spin. So is he saying stay in debt and invest the difference? I mean, that is a debt Weird, right? strategy. That is a debt elimination strategy to just simply yeah. pay the monthly minimums on everything, manage everything, pay everything on time, set up your auto pays, and take your excess disposable income, cash flow, whatever you want to call it, and you're saying to drive that into investments or maybe, maybe 
invest in self, invest in yourself and become an asset, become a creator, become a, a, you know, a business owner, entrepreneur, maybe. Best, yeah. And, best return on investment. If you best in, invest in your yeah. skills for sure. Yeah. Build up your skills, gifts and talents. And, and that now creates a environment, a mindset of abundance. And if you're operating yes. in abundance with a solid mindset and a solid a financial foundation, you've got everything going for you. It's just a matter of time before your moment strikes. And, and now you have this, this asset portfolio that's large enough, that's paying enough cash flow or dividends to cover your cost of living, to co cover your payments, and you can write a check at any point and pay off all your debt. Rather than Absolutely. The, rather than the flip side, which is kind of like in my world, where it's like, we're trying to figure out the fastest way to pay off debt so that we can invest quicker, faster. Um, so you kind of have to really measure which which makes the most sense. And I think personally what I've seen, and maybe you've witnessed this, maybe there's a level of debt elimination that has to occur where it's like, hey, let's, before you start investing in something you don't know or not aware of and just kind of almost making sure. it that, maybe we do need to get rid of these consumer debts first and fix our mindset and, and, and operate out of abundance. And then once we're left with maybe student loans, mortgage, we can just kind of let those ride and go full force investing, invest in skills, invest in, in your talent, in your gifts, and, and take the next five to seven years. Because I've done case studies on this on my channel where I compare someone getting out of debt over the next seven years versus someone following their, their purpose, passion, gifts. And then at year seven, they have enough money to write a check to pay everything off and right. they're cash flow positive and you know, 10 X their income or four X. Yeah. Right? They, they've got more to show for than the person that just became debt free. So, right. Depends on your end. Yeah, and, and I think a lot of that's going to depend on your income level, right? A lot of times people yeah. will say, Hey, Christian, where should I invest if I've got five or 10 grand? It's like, well, what's your income? If you're making several hundred thousand a year, then yeah, you can invest in some other things. But if you're making, 40,000 a year, take that 5,000 invested in your skills. Cause you can take that 40 or 50,000 a year income and you can go to a hundred. What kind of return is that on that 5,000? You can't plus. get that in the market. <laughs> no, right? no, it's, right. it's huge. Like, and, and you can get skills on everything I've spent. I mean, over the course of my life, I've spent over a hundred K on coaching and different skills and stuff like that. And I just, you know, I love it. Right there. You can learn anything that you want to learn and you can be anything that you want to, you want to be. And you can take that and find somebody that's going to coach you on it. Like you're, you're coaching people on, on finances, right? Mm -hmm. There's, there's coaches for everything. So I think that's the best one. It's just, but it depends on where your income level is. Focus on that, getting that up. Right. I think that's, I think that's the most important thing. If you're stuck at 50,000, right? Most of my family was stuck there forever. That's what I learned. It was luckily that I had a mentor that was like, Hey, no wait, you can actually get more than that. You don't have to stop there. Right. Where I started learning and then increasing the income a lot. Right. And so I think if you, if you realize that you can, you can take that and bump that income up to 50, 150, 200. Right. I mean, it's, it's endless out there. Um, and so I don't know, there's a lot of strategies to everything, which is so cool. I know. Well, and yeah. get as many of them as you can, right? Learn as many of them as you can. Like the more, it's, the more you spend time learning this stuff, learning how to get out of debt, learning how to increase income, learning how to invest, it becomes ingrained in you. Your whole life changes. Yeah. And Hey, that's, this, that's what else. This, this was really good. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for being patient with me. I know I talk a little slow, but thank you so much for taking the time educating my audience, giving them a different point of view. Hopefully that does wake up some people that are like, Oh, okay, maybe I'm doing, maybe I got some errors here, or maybe I can just simply tweak, optimize, improve my strategy. I tell people, you know, yes. it doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt to go down some rabbit holes, maybe not all of them, but it doesn't hurt to go down some of the rabbit holes in terms of debt elimination, different philosophies, different concepts, L allow sure. them to collide and see which one, you know, you get the best from Christian, get the best from Denzel, you get the best from Fantastic and kind of put them all together and this is your strategy to move forward with. And I think I just lost my buddy Christian here for a second. You just lost, you just lost my video feed. <laughs> I Sorry, I don't know why, but you're good. Sometimes oh, my cat, sometimes my camera will overheat. Ah, okay. Yeah. I know that can happen. I'm still so. here though. I'm still here. Yeah. So hey, Christian, no. Christian's still with us. We didn't lose him. It's a black screen right at the moment, but I want to take a few minutes, uh, 30 seconds or less. Christian, if you could just talk a little bit about your YouTube channel, and then I'm going to actually on my screen, uh, show them your channel and just talk to us about like, you know, primary topics you cover, um, how people can find you, maybe 
maybe work with you somehow. Maybe you can, you know, serve them. And we talk about investing, talk about debt elimination, these different things. If you want to kind of just speak to that in the last few minutes here, it'd be great. And I'm yes, sorry. thanks. And, and I and I want to say I really uh, I really enjoyed this. Um, my channel is very small, and this is probably the first collaboration that I've done like this. Really? And so it's really been a blast. And so I appreciate, yeah. Nice. I, I have I, the first. I, I, great. Yes, you do. Yes. So I've been in the industry a long time, but uh, this this stuff is kind of new. So so I, I, I appreciate it. It's been a fun experience, and I really appreciate the respectful dialogue. I think we need to have more of this. I think it's great when people can disagree on things and they can share both sides of it. Um, you know, that's, that's awesome. So yeah, the channel is called is, is mortgage IQ. Um, it's kind of, you know, a cross between, you know, mortgage advice and, and kind of some financial stuff. Um, the financial stuff seems to have more interest of course than mortgages because mortgages just aren't sexy, right? They're not, they're not as fun. Uh, the, fi this, the financial stuff, like what you're doing here is, 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 um, you know, way more fun. And so I'm going to be releasing more videos about the financial part, just given my experience as a, you know, lender and owning a mortgage company and working with thousands of clients and seeing thousands of credit reports and thousands of financial positions and everybody that has jobs and owns companies and multimillionaires or those that don't have any money, um, you know, and just sharing a lot of those uh, perspectives that I've learned over the course of that, uh, that 20 years. So there's going to be, you know, th there'd be more videos along the lines of that, um, coming up here soon and hopefully more of these little collaborations because this is fun yeah dude i love collaborating with other content creators so i've got your channel being promoted right now on my screen here you guys go check him out he's got really good content and the way you're doing your thumbnails you you, you definitely know what you're doing so it's only a matter of time before one of these things go a little viral and you start picking up some attention so i like what you're doing there with the with the thanks uh, i appreciate <laughs> it with the, <laughs> that, that works good that definitely attracts the eyeballs. See, I know you put out some good stuff. So again, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for those that are watching and you take the time to do. This was like a master class, really, of, of ideas. And we were able to yes. you know, uncover some things. I learned some things that were you know, super valuable that I'm going to take back into my practice. And again, help my clients make better decisions with their finances. So thank you all again. God bless. Have a wonderful day. And we'll be talking soon.